This is an image of Sir Thomas Lee, a London merchant, alderman and Lord Mayor in 1558. However, what do these titles mean? In England, in the late medieval period, many towns and cities became known as incorporated. This meant the town or city were responsible for what happened behind the city gates. Nowadays, we have a local council elected by popular vote. However, in the late medieval period, towns and cities were ultimately controlled by the guilds. A guild was a group or association of tradesmen who controlled their trade via agreements, setting wages, prices and memberships themselves for the individual areas. They were also the training centres for those areas too, looking after widows of dead members. These guilds met regularly in the guild hall and one of their activities was to elect their membership and aldermen to sit on a council or to help maintain the town or city. The aldermen then elected their Lord Mayor, who had an overall responsibility for the town or city, answerable to the King. Towns and cities were their own identities and were an important place for the King to seek income from. They loaned the King money and were also fined by the King for failing to develop dairy in Ireland by Charles I during the personal rule. The intention of this lecture is for you to be able to analyse the impacts of urbanisation and the population growth. Knowledge wise, you will be able to explain the changes in the levels of population. Skills wise, define the strata and position of individuals in society. And then behaviourally, consider and assess how far capitalism was responsible for the changes in society. At the start of our period of study, society was very much still on the feudal model with a monarch at the top, followed by their nobility, gentry, and at the bottom of society, everybody else. The ranks of nobility and gentry made up approximately 2% to 5% of the population. By the outbreak of civil war, the total number of gentry was around 15,000, made up of 3,000 higher and 12,000 lesser members. They controlled half of all wealth and property, 15% to the nobility, and the rest in the hands of the church or king. At the start of the 17th century, the power of the nobility was in decline, and it was very difficult to tell the difference in terms of wealth and influence between some lower nobles and upper gentry. To keep it simple, the nobility are as ancient hereditary peers with titles gifted to them by the king. There does begin an influx of new lower nobility at this time, and conflict was present. The decline in power of the nobility, however, was tied up in the matter of inflation, which was ever present in the century of inflation between 1540 and 1640. Wealth, for example, was tied to property, huge majestic buildings and large swathes of land. Power based on ancient honour and family ties. It is wrong, however, to generalise and say all nobility was declining. For example, the Marquis of Exeter donated £900,000 and the Earl of Worcester £700,000 to Charles I during the Civil War. It must be kept in mind that the average wage for a labourer at that time was around £10 per year. That means the Earl of Worcester donated the equivalent of £1.5 billion in modern terms. Most of the radical members of Parliament in the early 17th century came from the gentry stock. Many revisionist historians agree that in determining reasons for side-taking in the Civil War, that the idea of class has a limited responsibility. What tends to come across is the religious aspect and the person's adherence to a denomination of belief. Nevertheless, there is no doubt that the growing size of this group of people was a factor, as the gentry class had grown by around 300% from the early Tudor period, above the average rate of population growth. As a group, the gentry trended to hold the important civic offices in the shires, such as justices of the peace or judges. For example, Thomas Wentworth in 1628 was made a sheriff by Charles I and rose to the rank of an earl. The gentry became more powerful in England, and it must be remembered that not all gentry are the same. There are wide variations in the power the gentry had depending on the amount of land they owned or where in England they were based. There is no doubt that gentry became more powerful and influential between 1625 and 1688 
and how far that was due to the decline of the nobility is hotly debated. The gentry controversy it ignited spawned research into the 17th century and the 20th century and became one of the most heated debates seen in the academic world. To understand the gentry controversy, imagine a line graph. The x-axis is time and the y-axis is power, power being the level of influence, etc. According to the historian Tawney in 1941, the nobility starts at a high point and over time decreases, starting powerful and influential and ending with a massive reduction in the influence and power they had. The gentry conversely begin at a low relative to the end point of the nobility's power and end in higher, replacing the power the nobility had to begin with. The point where the two groups intersect is where the civil war happened as both groups battle for the top spot. The historians involved are R. H. Tawney, who argues this crisis caused the civil war with the decline in fortunes of the nobility and the increase in power of the gentry, filling the void left by the nobility in business and finance. The Marxist historian Lawrence Stone agreed with Tawney and added that the nobility's poor management of finance was the root of their decline. In the 1950s, Hugh Trevor Roper challenged this and suggested the gentry were also in decline, leading to them being disgruntled and forming anti-court groups against Charles. Christopher Hill, another Marxist, challenged Trevor Roper's evidence, used to base his theories. It is important to remember as well, these debates are based on generalisations and not all nobility and gentry changed. For example, though Oliver Cromwell was from gentry stock and rose the Lord Protector, many gentry lived out their lives within a few miles of their manor house without taking part in the national or even regional affairs. Marxist historians, however, will tend to support the idea of the two groups' opportunities changing, resulting in conflict, as this follows the determinism of Marxist ideology. If we recall the six stages of Marxist history, it can be easily explained. We have our stages of history ranging from the hunter-gatherer tribes on subsistence living to a communist society with no class or conflict. Marxists state that there will be a violent revolution to end capitalism, seeing the have-nots overthrow the haves and take over the means of production. However, in the gentry controversy, Marxists saw the civil war of 1642-1649 as a bourgeois revolution like the French Revolution of 1789. As we have covered before, the population of England changed drastically over the centuries. In 1348, the Black Death hit England and the population of England was halved. This level was maintained in the 15th century due to the wars such as the Hundred Years' War and the Wars of the Roses. However, after 1485 and the beginning of the Tudor reign, relative peace returned to England and the population exploded. Between 1600 and 1700, the population continued to grow up until 1650, when the impact of the civil wars could be seen and the changes to the marriage age. However, the 18th century will see a slow start in growth, but by 1800 the population of England reaches 9 million. This is due to the Industrial Revolution and the changes to trade and empire seen in the 17th century. If you break the data down even more, the urban population follows an interesting trend. During the Black Death, urban population remained almost static. In fact, not seen any major change until 1600 and the changes to trade in cities such as London. As covered before, the amount of towns with a population of over 5,000 between 1600 and 1700 almost tripled. Then considering the growth of empire and industrialization, urban population continues to grow. Rural data shows the drop in population due to the Black Death and non-agricultural workers were hit by the plague. However, like urban living, saw a rise in population, almost matching in growth. Nevertheless, agricultural workers were the worst hit by the Black Plague, and though they recovered by 1600, their raw numbers only ever increase in line with the explosion seen at the end of the 18th century. This bar graph helps highlight the impact the declining agricultural numbers had. At the start of the 14th century, 
three quarters of the population were agricultural workers. Seven centuries later, that was only one third. In the 17th century, almost a 15% drop in agricultural workers. The question is where did the workers go? They could all not be the nation's poor. In the urban areas, much of the growth in population could be traced back to the growth in merchants. This growth in merchants, not just in numbers, was also in their power and influence in towns and cities. Such towns as Bristol and Liverpool were dealing with trade, especially internationally, and the consumer boom after 1650 saw London as the commercial centre of the country, and this has no doubt contributed to a refocusing on trade as an occupation. By 1688, there was an estimated 64,000 merchants trading in England, an increase of 30,000 from 1580. Their position was very different from the gentry in society. They were distrusted, looked down upon by the educated elite. Nevertheless, because it was possible for merchants to accumulate as much wealth as members of the gentry and hold positions of power and influence in towns and cities, comparable to the country gentlemen, some of the younger sons of gentry family moved into trade. Also, the very belief in how one could move up the social ladder changed as well. In previous centuries, it was all about the marriage arrangements between families. Now it's about how much capital you had. Ready cash in large quantities was far superior than having one's wealth tied up in property. With ready-made money, people could invest quickly, take part in a consumer society, and if they really wanted, they could buy status. As the 17th century progressed and society was greatly remodelled based on power and influence rather than rank and privilege, a professional service class of lawyers, doctors, architects, academics and bankers grew. This increase in the professional class is slim in evidence. However, the records of the Inns of Court show an increase of lawyers from 120 to 200 between 1574 and 1619. This is a shift away from the clergy as a profession. The lawyers tend to be 90% sons of nobility and gentry. This reflects a lack of opportunity for the lower orders. Grammar education not possible for yeoman farmers and not for girls, so this growth from professionalism was limited, but impactful on the progress of Britain. If we reconsider the gentry controversy, with the added information regarding the merchants and professionals, and in some way taking Trevor Roper's views on board, we can redraw the graph. Tawny, Stone and Hill agree that the Civil War was a response to a clash of power and influence between the nobility and gentry as they converged over the 17th century. However, Trevor Roper suggests the gentry were also in decline, perhaps at a slower rate, meaning they still converged. Nevertheless, over this we can suggest a growth in the merchants, which also clashed with the groups at different times. For example, the merchant groups began later than the gentry and certainly by the end of the 18th century were more powerful and influential in towns and cities than the gentry who remained supreme in the country. What is certainly clear is it is not as simple as Tawney originally laid out. Current post-revisionist theory states that the Civil War was not an inevitable event. It was, however, unavoidable. What made it a Civil War was Charles I. If the clash had happened under a different reign or ruler, in all likelihood a compromise would have happened, something more like the Glorious Revolution of 1688. In 1625 then, society followed the basic feudal model of the king at the top, with nobility below, with the power and influence to control the localities, the growing gentry, the middle insult, becoming landowners, and beneath them, everybody else. By 1688, this structure had changed. Rather than deference as the key determinant for society, it is now power and influence. At the top was a group known as the elite. The elite is a group of individuals who are the most powerful and influential people in society. This includes members of the monarchy, nobility, gentry and the new merchant group. Influencing government policy by how much leverage they can use against the group below. The merchants, gentry and nobility now occupy a space together, and depending where they are in the country depends on their level of power and influence. The merchants tended to hold the urban areas, while the gentry in the rural areas. These three groups made up Parliament. The groups with less power and influence include yeomen, who were farmers who owned the land they worked on, 
unlike the gentry who profited from the land which was worked, then husbandmen who were farmers who did not own the land they worked on. Supporting this new structure was an emerging group of professionals and service workers. Society had greatly changed over the century. The reasons behind this is varied and can include a greater tolerance of religion and acceptance of ideas, a move to a capital-based society, in short capitalism, the growth of trade and empire. All of this was made possible by a decline in the power of the monarchy. The last section of society to consider is the role of women. The role changed over the 17th century and very much up to the Civil War, women were seen as the property of their husbands or fathers. Unmarried women were untrustworthy and eyed with suspicion of witchcraft in some areas. However, the role a woman took in the public or private spheres of influence depended greatly on her background and place in society. Like during the First and Second World Wars, women during the Civil War took on the responsibilities of their households to cover the men who had gone off to fight. Managing gentry land escapes and in some cases leading the defence of the family home against parliamentarians or royalist troops. The growth of Puritanism and its need for an education to ensure morals and values saw women become educators in the home to teach their children the importance of the Bible. Quaker women gained more freedoms, though this of course is relative. In the 15 schools founded by 1671, only four were willing to teach girls. However, women were at the forefront of political and social campaigns. Level of women campaigned for changes and the release of several level of prisoners, such as Catherine Chidley. The diggers, however, unlike the levellers, called for female suffrage. But in comparison to all the Protestant sects, it was the Quakers who offered the most freedoms for women, seeing women speak up in church. However, Quakers only made up just over 1% of the population by 1680. During the Interregnum, the Marriage Act 1653 allowed civil marriages, which were largely ignored as most men lost their rights over their wives. The Adultery Act 1650 targeted women over men's sexual dismeanours, which was seen as a lesser crime than women's. In Middlesex, 24 women and 12 men were tried for adultery in the 1650s, and in Devon, men only accounted for 10% of the 255 charged between 1650 and 1660. The Restoration saw a profound change for women as they were able to perform on stage for the first time, though probably more to do with Charles II's love of theatre and women than a drive for equality. Nell Gwynne was one of these actresses and became one of Charles II's most celebrated mistresses. The Restoration also gave women an opportunity of influence, power and celebrity via the position of mistress. However, the question is, who in this case was exploiting who? The intention of this lecture was for you to analyse the impacts of urbanisation and population growth. Knowledge wise, you can now explain the changes in the levels of population. Skills wise, define the strata and position of individuals in society. Behaviourally, consider and assess how far capitalism was responsible for the changes in society. Now complete your associated material.